of my medical record. Again, forgive me because I am working off of my medical record, so this will probably be a little bit more disjointed than usual. But I present to you the case of a 45-year-old gentleman who comes to the ER with dyspnea on exertion and cough. Um, oh, is it your, do you want me to, I can't tell you, we're just about to move your lips again, Drew. Do you want to go more or is it good enough? Uh, I'll jump in a little bit further because, uh, again, with 30 minutes, I figure get more information in. Um, so this dyspnea on exertion and cough has been going on for about a month prior to the, uh, to, to this admission, but it had worsened over the week prior. Um, cough was not productive, comes and goes no real association with major physical activity or other exposures, but the patient thinks that the cough might be related to dust from the air conditioner at his work. Um, and getting short of breath after uh, going upstairs uh, and heavy lifting while he was at work and resolves with rest. He also notes that he's had about 10 to 15 pounds worth of weight loss over the last two to three months, um, at least what he estimates. Per the records that we had, it was about 25 pounds over the last, I believe it was five months. Um, no wheezing, although there may have been one episode a couple of days prior to the admission. Um, and also about five months prior to the admission, he had an episode of contact dermatitis of his lower extremities that he received prednisone for and it since resolved. I'll stop there for now um, and give you guys time to discuss um, what you guys are thinking so far. I love it. This is a very intriguing presentation, Drew, for many reasons and maybe um, I'll just articulate why um, and then pass the mic to Charmaine for the rest of it. I think um, the, the series of complaints that land you on the, the thorax are often really chest pain and dyspnea. Um, you ask yourself, like, what makes you think of cardiopulmonary disease? What makes you think of things in the thorax? It's usually those two complaints. And I just wanted to anchor you in the fact that there are almost no benign causes of dyspnea on exertion. So in the world of chest pain, in the real world of chest pain, most causes are actually benign. A small minority of chest pain, as those of you working on the front lines will attest, is actually sinister. And so from the get-go, the moment you hear shortness of breath, the probability of something sinister is very high. And there's maybe two or three benign causes of shortness of breath, like deconditioning or um, not. To, I don't think panic disorder is actually benign. It's not benign at all. Uh, but it's certainly not acutely life-threatening in that moment. So the moment you hear dyspnea is the moment that you know you need an answer pretty quickly. And the question is, what does it mean when somebody says that I have dyspnea on exertion? How is that, how is that different than dyspnea at rest? And I will tell you that it, all, it tells you the time course. So you immediately know the time course when somebody they have dyspnea on exertion because if they have shortness of breath enough that they only detect it when it, they exert themselves, they probably won't come to the emergency room right away or come for evaluation right away. It's not that you suddenly become, an, you, you wake up as a normal person then suddenly only have shortness of breath on exertion. So we know that this is a subacute to chronic dyspnea by virtue of the first three words alone. So there's a lot less to de decipher, but this is the value of the chief concern. With just three words, you know, the probability of something sinister is high because dyspnea has much less uh, much more morbidity than chest pain. And the fact that the patient chose to tell you that it, exert, it occurs with exertion means that it's been going on for some time, which takes the dyspnea landscape and changes it quite a bit. It's still long, heart other, but um, the diagnoses we entertain are a lot different. But I'll pass the mic to Charmaine to tackle the rest of the HBI. Poetry, you can just keep talking, RG. I don't mind it one bit, and I'm sure nobody else will too. <laughs> that was beautiful. I 100% agree with that. And I think the other, 
aspect of this case that has me worried is this weight loss, um, about 20 pound weight loss over the last few months. Again, there might be a component of that being intentional, something to ask the patient, but either way, even if people are trying to lose weight, the tempo of that in relation to uh, the symptoms, um, it makes you have to consider that like, hey, is this part of the symp uh, symptomatology of this um, illness that we're dealing with? Um, and kind of like kind of marrying the two of someone who is coming with like worsening dyspnea on exertion um, for about a month with this background of unintentional weight loss uh, makes you think of like, hey, is there anything inflammatory going on? And, you know, with inflammation, uh, we think about, you know, our infectious ideologies, our malignancies, something to think about here as well, in addition to, you know, the rest of the I made uh, mnemonic. The one uh, aspect that, again, like that Drew mentioned, was that kind of the prednisone use of the last about five months ago. So the question becomes like, A, well, why, what was the amount of prednisone for how long? And if there's uh, one hypothesis to entertain is that like, hey, was something that was happening in the background, was that truly contact dermatitis or not? Or is that something that the prednisone just kind of unleashed um, in the immune system, especially if there was like an indolent infection um, and did that prednisone play a role or is it a red herring in this case? Um, I think in terms of like a diagnostic, uh, making diagnostic progress, uh, getting in to know this patient a little bit more, thinking about who is this patient, the background information, how immunosuppressed they are, um, and getting some like exam lab imaging, the differential diagnosis for weight loss, for dyspnea and aggression are quite broad. And um, so whatever we can um, hang our heads and use as pivot points in the Past medical history and exam would be really um, informative. But again, like, you know, this presentation, 45 year old, I think infection, infection is something that you want to rule out while, um, while giving a thought to other categories. Drew, can't wait to hear more. I absolutely love it. Um, so you asked for background. I'll give you background. Um, and just to answer a couple of questions that have been put into the chat. Um, to Kushal's question about travel, incarceration, or immigration from uh, any country where there may be some sort of um, weird endemic infectious disease, the answer is no. Um, this patient lives in the Midwest United States um, and has not traveled outside of that area in his practically entire life. Um, in terms of his past history, the only thing that's really notable is a diagnosis of hypertension. Um, in terms of his medications, let me just see real quick exactly what he was on. The only things that he was on were amlodipine, atorvastatin, and labetalol. In terms of his family history, just hypertension in his father, not much else of note. Past procedures were only really notable for having his tonsils and adenoids removed. He has seasonal allergies, but no allergies to any medications. And in terms of his social history and um, health-related behaviors, um, he lives at home with his parents. He works at a big box department store in the gardening department where he typically handles big bags of soil and fertilizer. He also likes to go fishing, um, but does not have any overtly concerning chemical or environmental exposures, um, does not work around farm animals. He does not have any pets. The only other thing that he notes is that because he lived, um, his room is down in the basement of his parents' house, um, there was some concern for mold. And there was seemingly a small spot of mold upstairs in the parents' house, but that had been cleaned. And in terms of health-related behaviors, he does not smoke. He does not drink all that much, maybe about one beer per week. 
and does not have any drug use whatsoever, uh, not even cannabis, which is legal in the state that this patient was seen in, and no other injection drug use either. Roxy, no. Uh, is that a good place to stop, Drew? Let me give the physical exam as well, and I'll also put up an image uh, afterward because I'll get you to the point where the actual interesting part is for this case. So, vitals. Temperature of 98.1 Fahrenheit. Heart rate of 97. Blood pressure of 142 over 91 and respiratory rate of 40. And I believe he was requiring, uh, he was requiring supplemental oxygen. I think it was on the order of about four to five liters or so when he was initially admitted. On exam, he does not appear in very acute respiratory distress. And he appears like he is of normal weight. He doesn't look ill or look diaphoretic. Cardiovascular wise, normal rate, or sorry, he's tachycardic, but otherwise regular rhythm. No murmurs, no rubs, no gallops. Pulmonary wise, besides the tachypnea, he does have rels in the right upper, left upper, right middle and left middle fields. No wheezing or ronchi and no strider. And he doesn't have any accessory muscle usage or anything that would indicate that he is in acute respiratory distress. And HE and T exam, nothing really of note. Abdominal exam, normal. MSK exam, normal. And he also does not have any lymphadenopathy in his neck. Neurowise, normal. He's alert, he's oriented to everything, and he uh, doesn't have any focal deficits. But the main thing that I want to show, and I will share this uh, screen, uh, is that as soon as we saw this one image, we got really scared. And I will show it to you when I get permission to do so. Uh, you should be good, Drew. Right there. <laughs> it's still black, so I don't see how, there you go. <laughs> yep. You are looking at the CT scan of this patient. I will stop there for now, because at this point, I want to know what everybody would do when they see this as an image. Because the first thing that we said was, holy great mother of God, what have we gotten ourselves into? Uh <laughs> Drew, you know, you never disappoint, my friend. Uh, but I'm going to disappoint you by holding off on discussing imaging and discuss the background and leave the uh, exam and imaging to RG. So I think in terms of the background, um, just to go this is uh, the matic, um, in terms of his um, history of hypertension, medications, don't see any culprit there. Uh, you know, for a 45-year-old, just having history of hypertension is not a uh, it's not too surprising. I always like want to be open to the possibility of someone who might not be uh, in, in contact with healthcare as much. Um, in terms of like his uh, background of living in the Midwest, I think, um, you know, uh, in terms of infectious ideologies to consider with that imaging that I can get out of my head is like a histoblasto. The other thing that I want to always be open with, even though the patient hasn't traveled, is that it doesn't mean other people haven't traveled to him with something. So kind of thinking about um, his surrounding who live with, where they have been or not. Uh, Drew, amazing uh, job getting a health-related behavior and exposure history. The soil and the gardening, it's 
um, interesting, especially in the setting of thinking about someone who had some lower, lower extremity rash at some point, especially if that was contact dermatitis with dry skin, they can be opening if he is, you know, working in a garden um, where like a lot of different bugs can possibly enter. Um, uh, thinking about like, you know, nocardia, thinking about some uh, some bacteria like Pseudomonas that live in the soil, although with Pseudomonas would probably suspect a more acute um, time course. Uh, and like, uh, you know, Mikor, he doesn't have the classic history of diabetes, but you know, things to consider. Um, and basically I think that's all I had to say before the exam. Um, RG, anything to add? Oh yeah, yeah. No, I just I'm shocked. The respiratory rate of 40 in that CT is it's it's very impressive. And I think it's even more impressive given the um given the accumulating evidence that this is a um pulmonary disease alone. You know, we're not getting any flavor, although the labs will be helpful. We're not getting any flavor that this patient has any neurological symptoms or any abdominal symptoms. And so here's how I would go about breaking this disease process. Looking at that CT can be very intimidating, but um, our job is to try to simplify it as much as possible. And I will tell you, this can be only one of five things. Either this, this um, fluid in the, in the lungs is from pus, water, blood, fat, or or cells. Again, what's that list of five things this could be? This is either pus, water, which are the two most common, blood, diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, cells. Cells is a big term that captures a variety mm -hmm. of inflammatory reactions or foreign material. And that foreign material could be fat, could be all sorts of things. So how can we prioritize between these two, between these five possibilities? The first is to recognize that um, water is unlikely because water buildup in the lungs usually accompanies water buildup everywhere else. And this is called volume overload. And we know this patient doesn't have volume overload because they've lost 15 pounds. So now we're down to four things. Is it pus? Is it blood? Is it cells, which we'll talk about? or is it foreign material? And the truth is the priority now is to focus on pus. And this being pus is the most important thing to assess for. And um, that will almost certainly result in a bronchoscopic evaluation and a serological workup. And the range of infectious possibilities has been, um, has been uh, brought about in the chat. And the key thing to recognize is now you need to know the immune status of this patient because that will change everything. Could this be blood? The possibility of blood will be further augmented if we see blood in the kidneys because blood in the lungs is often accompanied by blood in the kidneys. And so here the UA is gonna be crucial. Foreign material, I'll leave that for later if it comes up. The key category here is to think about cells. The cells category is refers to inflammatory diseases in the lungs triggered by foreign material, which Drew was giving us a rich history for, that can come in the form of hypersensitivity pneumonitis, aspiration, or more importantly, um, uh, especially in a patient with such extensive disease, to think about vaping, or what's called e-valley, e-vaping cigarette associated lung disease. So that's um, the irritants. And then another important category is autoimmune diseases. So autoimmune diseases cause devastating lung consequences, the most common of which that can cause this kind of CT is the myositides. So in this patient doing a muscle exam and getting a CK is really, really important. So we have five categories, water, pus, blood, cells, and foreign material. Water's out because the patient's losing weight. Foreign body is too rare to think about now. Pus is the priority check the immune status. And cells are evocative of exogenous substances like vaping, hypersensitive pneumonitis, um, and um, looking for myositis will be really, really important. And so will the UA for bleeding. So that's how we'd break it down. Um, the other profound clue is how impacted the lungs are and how uh, little they're the disease elsewhere. And when that's the case, it puts the priority on something inhaled into the lungs as opposed to something systemic. So if we get no systemic signature of the disease, then the question will be what is coming into lungs from the outside world? All right, Dhruv, back to you.
Sorry about that. Uh, had a couple of um, chat questions that are apparently trying to make me give away the answer, which no, I am not going to. Um, I will say though that this patient is HIV negative and that his CBC, the only thing that was really notable was a white count of 13.1 with a neutrophilic differential. So 85% neutrophils. His hemoglobin was normal at 13.9 and his platelets were normal at 360. And his MCV was slightly low at 78.1. In terms of his electrolytes and liver enzymes, sodium of 141, potassium of four, chloride of 102, CO2 of 27, with an anion gap of 12. BUN of 17, creatinine of 0 0.87, glucose of 132, calcium of nine, total protein of, scratch that, AST of 15, ALT of 14, Alkaline phosphatase of 154, albumin of 3.5, total protein of 6.8, and a total bilirubin of 0 0.3. We do not have a direct. His C-reactive protein was elevated at 103.6. His procalcitonin was normal. Uh, it was 0 0.05 and uh, positive is greater than 0 0.5. NT pro BNP was 183, which is slightly elevated. He is COVID and flu negative. And we later did a full respiratory pathogen panel, which was completely negative. His lactate was normal at 1.7. We got blood cultures, which were negative. And now for the big workup. We basically did every single infectious disease workup underneath the sun. Um, histoantigen, blastoantigen, and antibodies, uh, coccidiomycosis antigen, um, a quantiferon TB, fungitel, platelia, um, what else? Uh, Q fever, Bartonella, uh, Brucella, Legionella, uh, EBV, CMV. Of all of that, the only thing that came back anything positive was that he had a positive EBV IgG and a positive EBV early antigen. That's it. His autoimmune panel was not much better. His um, rheumatoid factor was negative. His CK was normal at 47. His ANA was positive at 1 to 160 with a speckled pattern, but his anti-CCP antibody was negative. His entire ANCA panel was negative. And all of the uh, endonuclear antibody panel, so anti-double-stranded DNA, ribosomal, SSA, SSB, all of that, negative. Varicella zoster was negative. Aspergillus antigen. Um, okay. Angiotensin converting enzyme was low at 14. And 125 dihydroxy vitamin D was normal at 32. I'm going to leave it there for now. We did do a bronch, and the bronch actually revealed the final diagnosis. Ay, ay, ay. All right. Drew, um, 
thank you for, I, I think these, this case is actually pretty hard to present because you clearly know the answer and um, having to be comprehensive about the testing that took you there is hard, but it's really important because whatever the diagnosis is, it has to bypass a very rigorous infectious evaluation. And for those of you who are listening, know that this case, if played a hundred times over in a hundred different people, probably will lead to a conclusion that we won't reach to today. So in other words, you probably would have picked up some fungus, some infectious organism. And um, just because we're bypassing that more probable path today doesn't mean that this workup wasn't necessary and important. And um, I will just say that, um, that infection, even though um, it's been thoroughly evaluated here, I think it does take a bronchoscopic evaluation to, to be confident about that because the serological assessment of, of infections is imperfect inherently and then imperfect when you apply filters like it's a localized disease, um, you're only looking for serology, so on and so forth. So you have to be very careful with that. Um, and I think at the end of the day, if you don't, we don't, if we don't know what the answer is, what you should know is what the next steps are. And the next step are is, is to is to just like the lung, study the urine very closely. So study the bronchialveolar fluid very closely and ultimately you might need the biopsy. Um, so that's the pathway to take here. And I'll pass the mic to Charmaine to see what sh thoughts she has. Um, and um, we can tag team the guessing game of what the answer here is in this case. Yeah, beautifully said, um, RJ, and I, I totally agree. I think like once an active disease is happening, the serology is good, it's helpful. Uh, also, it's not end all be all. I think it's just healthy to have a degree of skepticism um, with anything in medicine. Uh, is that like, hey, how good is this test in the context of the disease that you're worried about? And I think like um, what RJ uh, had initially um, said about this disease being the focus in the palm and with that with not that many systemic signature is quite valid. So where to go is to go to the lungs and try to understand that you know uh, something like TB we need AFP cultures from the source um, to be able to fully evaluate that. Um, cultures in the blood are not that great. Um, and um, I think the other thing that I believe Anne-Marie mentioned from the beginning is like, I, I believe this patient is HIV negative, but uh, I thought the PJP is a good thing and getting an LDH would be helpful here. But again, you need a bronchoscopy to evaluate that. Um, the one thing that I think was positive was like the early antigen for uh, EBV. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but the EBV IgG being positive, I think it just means this patient has had EBV in the past. And um, diseases that cause an acute inflammation in the body can at times cause um, uh, cause um, IgM uh, for EBV to become positive. So I, I think this is most likely represents a past infection. Um, but in terms of like the guessing game, um, what are your thoughts? RG. You know, I, I love that. I think that interpreting EBV in the context of something else is really important. And I think it could commonly reactivate. Um, I'll tell you that I will use one very, uh, one very important thing uh, in general, but you can't hammer it home. And I want you all to pay attention to one thing. This person has been short of breath for one month. And if this were an infection, the fact that it has wreaked devastation on the lung for a whole month and has not gone anywhere else is highly unusual and only characteristic of two infections that involve the lung, and that's PJP and viral infections in immunocompromised patients. I don't know of any other infection that doesn't go anywhere else a month into, into the lungs when it has done, done so much damage. And we'll use that as a big determiner of actually going away from infectious stuff. Um, of course, assuming this is not PJP and PJP being so alveolar would be unusual. So I'm bypassing that to the inhaled, the stuff that might be inhaled coming into the lungs. This doesn't look like hypersensitivitis is a CT. The CT just doesn't look like HP for a variety of reasons. So I'm in the world of, um, does this patient have occult vaping exposure? And that is a little bit less likely because the illness script is usually more hectic. The patient, patients are usually febrile and they usually have much more GI symptoms. And they usually are much more hypoxemic. About 50% of those patients land in the ICU. So for those reasons, I think that's a little bit less likely. And for me now, that's where I think we have to open that foreign 
uh, a form material category. And that form material category is actually a long list of things. You can have fat emboli get into the, you can have fat accumulate in the lung. You can have pulmonary alveolar proteinosis or PAP accumulate in the lung. You could have lipids like lipoid pneumonia accumulate in the lung. You can actually have stones build up in your lung called um, pulmonary microlithiasis. And you can have, um, as, uh, as we, uh, Austin actually presented a case of talc granulomatosis where you can have talc build up in the lungs. So for me, this case is about, I think, making sure that you don't have vaping in the mix and then figuring out um, what the foreign material is. Um, and for me, I think, um, I would, the one actionable form material is lipoid pneumonia, where you can talk to the patient about any, um, any neti pots they're using. It's all esoteric and fancy stuff, but I'll pass the mic to Drew to tell us what the answer is. Okay, so I did uh, intentionally withhold a couple of things. So this thing wasn't exclusively in the lungs. Uh, he actually had some lesions in his uh, spine and his uh, liver as well. Um, and when we bronched him, all of the infectious workup was negative, but when they took a look at it under cytology and sent samples to PATH, lung adenocarcinoma. That's the final diagnosis. And unfortunately for him, uh, there was a whole bunch of complications as a result of it. The bronch actually caused a pneumothorax, um, which he actually recovered from quite well. Uh, the issue, though, was that about a month later, respiratory arrest, cardiac arrest, and the patient ultimately died. So, unfortunately, kind of a sad ending. Wow. Um, Drew, thank you so much for sharing this um, story. And I'm very sad to hear about the complications that has happened. And unfortunately, this being cancer, and if it looks this bad, um, you worry about all the complications that it can uh, have. So thank you for sharing with us. I appreciate you. Yeah, I think um, in terms of like having it been metastasized to other places, um, so 45 year olds quite young. Um, so I'm just super bummed to hear. I wish it was infection. That's how I'm gonna put it. RG, any thoughts? Yeah, I think um, Drew had to pick up the phone judging by video. I agree. I think. I would just emphasize how radically different it is when you discover an extra pulmonary focus of the disease. And that changes the calculus tremendously. And um, to share with you the, um, the schema that I was working off of, um, essentially it's this. Um, we essentially had a rare situation where the patient had a chronic consolidation for a month. And um, the range of possibilities is actually much longer than this, but this is a prioritized list of those things. And you'll see that as soon as you label it as, um, ha as has extra pulmonary features, there's not much else left than cancer. Um, all these diseases tend to be restricted to the lungs. So I think the efficient path to a diagnosis of any disease is to first tally the inventory of where it is, where it exists. And as soon as you see that there is a um, extra pulmonary disease signature, you can make so much progress. And despite the morbidity of um, this patient's eventual diagnosis, I think um, anytime that you can get a diagnosis more efficiently and effectively, you set somebody up for a higher chance of success. That doesn't mean necessarily survival in, in, in a case like this. I'd probably guess, I don't know if groups here that this is a mucinous lung adenocarcinoma which is a rare version um, just based on the CT pattern and very morbid. Um, the only reason I know of this, I actually learned this very recently a month ago in a UCSF m and um, that young patient with this condition. So um, I don't know too much about it to share more, but I know it, it's one of the rare, rare ways that a cancer shows up as a consolidation and it's very, very morbid. Um, it looks like Dhruv is still away. Um, so I will pass the mic to Valet to round us up with teaching points. Thank you for this amazing case and really great discussion. I really enjoyed the ID differential, even though it was not that final diagnosis. So just to give a couple of teaching points for the 30 minute PMR today. Um, so in the chat, they shared a lot of schemas from uh, people that are also part of the 
BMR family, like Dr. Singh, that has an amazing uh, scheme of cell-related infections, which was a risk factor that the patient had that includes uh, fungi and bacteria, such as nocardia, histo, and also meliodosis is a favorite of Koshal. And also the miliary pattern on chest CT, I really recommend the episode of miliary infections of uh, favorite podcast. Uh, that includes three main categories to think when we found behind this uh, imaging. First, TB, then fungi, and then in plastic diseases, which was the case um, today. And also um, some perils were that uh, in an immunocompetent host without disseminated disease, um, some fungi markers like beta-D-glucan and the histoplasma antigen can be negative even in onset of disease. And so we need to take that in consideration. And also um, a differential of infectious diseases that can present with a positive ANA include TB, which is the most common one, but also syphilis, HIV, and other infections like Bartonella and E. coli. So thank you so much for this discussion. It was really, really great. Wow, you're amazing. Uh, thank you so much. So, so concise, so fantastic, captured all the important uh, features. Really appreciate you, everyone. Thank you so much for um, joining us for today. We can't wait to see you tomorrow and talk some more medicine. Thanks, Drew, for presenting. Bye.